Welcome to the 58th episode of Beyond Social Media Show. I am David Erickson, uh, your co-host. I'm with B.L. Ackman, uh, my co-host. <laughs> Every week we uh, do the best of social media, online communications, advertising, marketing. We do the worst of marketing, advertising, online communications. Uh, we do. We talk about some shiny new objects we've found, and then we wrap it up with the daily numbers. We do have a guest with us today, uh, Krishna, and I'm going to throw it to Krishna to talk about herself and what she does and, and, uh, and plug herself a little bit, and then we'll start the show. Delighted to be with you, and my name's Krishna Day. I'm in Ireland, and I work in digital communication, social media, and online reputation. And I'm here just wrangling any comments that we may have, but perhaps you guys are going to explain to people about how that's going to work today, because it's a bit of a different show. Sure, yeah. sure. Krishna, tell people how... Before we go into that, let's uh, make sure that people know how to find you, Krishna. You'll find me on Google Plus, and if you're on the event page, you'll find a link to my profile there. And uh, it's Google Plus, so it's Plus Krishna Day Online. That's K R I S H N A D E Online. And my business page is Plus Krishna Day. Thanks so much for asking. Very good, sure. And on Twitter, you're Krishna Day, right? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> she is everywhere. She's not kidding. <laughs> um, well, so Dave, um, do our do our normal. Uh, intro and then we'll explain what we're doing here. <laughs> okay, yeah, I am David Erickson. Uh, you can find me at D Erickson on Twitter at e-strategyblog.com. Uh, BL is at uh, maximum-plus.com. You can find her on Twitter at what's next uh, at her what's next blog.com and you write for Ad Age as well. So go ahead, tell us what we're doing. Tell us uh, what our new experiment is uh, is BL. Okay, well, what you will see on the right side of the Hangout screen is the new beta showcase app that Google released this week for Hangouts on Air. I believe it's going to become a game changer in the use of Hangouts, and uh, right now it's a bit of a clunky mess, but um, what it does is it allows us to include links that you will be able to click on and interact with uh, during the Hangout. And so it opens up the potential for an author to sell books, for people to sign up for a webinar during a Hangout, for a product demonstration to be shown simultaneously with, with a conversation about it. it. It completely changes the dynamic of interaction that's possible. What it's doing right now, which is the part that I find clunky, is that it's popping out into its own player and so it's taking you to a separate screen from the event page and we are not able to use comment tracker which is the way that we might be used to getting comments during a hangout but there is a Q&A app that we've yet to use in a live broadcast that would allow us to have comments in the stream that we would see and be able to respond to during the show However, what's happening right now, because it's only been live for a few days, is that there are two, two screens that you might need to have open if you want to comment during the show, and Krishna is going to look at the comments on the event page and let us know when there is one. So if you want to say something, we'll know about it as long as you have two windows open and one of them is the event page for the show or in fact the YouTube page, but uh, we don't normally get comments on the YouTube page, so we're going to concentrate on the event page for the show. Krishna, uh, what, are your, what is your feeling about where this will go? Oh, this is really exciting. I mean, I've been tracking this. I don't know you guys have in terms of it started off with shoppable hangouts and large brands using it. I think this is really relevant no matter what kind of organization you are. So if you're a nonprofit, you could be talking about the fact that you've got a campaign coming up and perhaps you're looking for volunteers and you could therefore direct people with one click to a page where people could find out more about what's required there so it doesn't have to be just for social commerce you know I can see the applications you mentioned about somebody who's written a book you could take them over to find the you know opt-in to get your um, free chapter it might be something else that you're leading people to so very exciting I think it's going to be take a little bit of people getting used to um, but this replaces what some people have been using so some people have been wrapping hangouts around with uh, some other tools 
perhaps you've explained them in, in previous shows, which allow people then to actually put in promoted links and so on. So really exciting, lots of opportunities, perhaps a bit of confusion at the beginning. More than a bit. Um, the other thing that happened this week that I think is very significant is Google announced that they will provide help to their enterprise clients who use enterprise apps for Hangouts. So that is also a game changer because that means that Hangouts are very much here to stay. And there's one thing that I noticed or was pointed out during the week on the event page in the part called Details. It says broadcast for free. I wonder what that means. I wonder if that is we're trying to let you know that you are not paying for this platform or it's free now. <laughs> so to be continued on that one. Um, but you know, I, I think what we have here is extremely significant. And uh, the other thing that happens that you should be aware of as a viewer is if you do click on one of those links, it'll take you away from here to another browser window. So then you're going to have to find your way back to the Hangout if you want to look at it um, during the live event. When you look at the video after the event, the Hangout links will be open and live, and you will be able to interact with them after the fact as well, which is very, very cool, and uh, just nothing else does that. I should just say that perhaps some people are watching your show um, on a mobile device, I watch a lot of events after the event on even my phone, so you won't be able to get to that through your mobile device at the moment. So you might want to come back to the event page here for the Beyond Social Media show and this episode, and then see what what we mean. Or in fact, BL, if you uh, if you embed this on your web page, um, or if you put it onto Facebook and so on, you'd be able to see a little yellow uh, mark at the bottom that says, you know, about clicking onto it. Now, it doesn't say to get to the links or get to the showcase app, but on the bottom left. So just be aware when you're watching on mobile, you don't get this integrated experience that we're seeing here at the minute. I did put slides in the photos for the show, and I also made a little video that demonstrates what happens when you watch it after the fact and how you join it. You know, yes, it's complicated. Yes, there's a learning curve. Take the time to do it and you won't be sorry. <laughs> so, um, do you want to get going, Dave? Let's start with the worst. We've talked about the best and the worst of, uh, of this new feature of uh, Google Hangouts on here, so let's just jump right into the uh, worst of what happened last week in the rest of the world. BL, of course, you always have the honors. What went wrong? Well, one of the things that went wrong is that BuzzFeed had to fire one of their editors, Benny Johnson, over plagiarism, and there was a whole Twitter storm about it, and uh, more than 50 of his articles apparently had plagiarized content, and then uh, he was really jumped on by Gawker, and his uh, editor fired him publicly, and you know he got caught lifting text from Yahoo Answers, from Wikipedia, from lots of other authors' posts and articles, and he took them pretty much verbatim. And I can tell you from experience, he is not the only one who is plagiarizing, who is lifting information, you know, without attribution. It is sort of the way of the internet. It's it's a very sad fact of those of us who produce content on a regular basis. Your content gets stolen, but he was in a very public space where he was supposed to be producing his own content, not stealing it from others. And you know, I, I just think this is really sad. It happens over and over. It's sad for him. It's sad for the people whose work was stolen. And it's without a doubt a worse practice. They're, they're, I don't know what else I can really say about well, it's, it. It's, I mean, it, it has, as you said, it's been happening all along. It's been happening way before, you know, online communications came around. The fact is, online communications came around, and people can find out very easily now. Uh, whether or not somebody's plagiarized. I mean, you know, if you haven't got the message yet, don't do it. <laughs> it's very easy. You will be found out eventually, and uh, and probably very publicly too. In this case, you know. But you know, I kind of think like him being fired publicly in this way is kind of like Martha Stewart going to jail for insider trading. Like he was made an example of. He was really, really made an example of, and maybe they didn't have to be quite so nasty. Uh, I disagree. I disagree, and I'll, uh, and I'll tell you why at the end of the show with the daily numbers, because there's a reason they had to do that. So I'll, I'll address that later in the show. <laughs> okay, well, I have something that's clearly, like, maybe the worst and most distasteful 
of the entire millennium. And that is an ad for Ducalax that ran in China. And um, essentially what it is is turds in prison. I'm not kidding. Um, they're inside a bowel, really. And the tagline on the ad that was done by McCann Health uh, says, only you can set them free. And um, <laughs> the agency says that they thought it would be a good idea to approach the product from the excrement's point of view. Um, really. And the ad ran all over China. And, and, and probably this is the worst part. Um, intention to purchase <laughs> increased by 57%. And they claim that awareness went from 0 to 21%. So does this mean that people in China were not constipated? <laughs> <laughs> OK. You're right. It's gross. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's distasteful. But it is also funny. <laughs> Uh, sorry, my scatological uh, uh, side of me is coming out, but come on. <laughs> well, you, did you look at the picture? I know. <laughs> okay, well, I I equally distasteful, perhaps, was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie poster that it's going to be released on 9-11 in Australia. And uh, the tweet that had the movie poster has since been deleted. But as you know, what goes online stays online forever. And uh, it showed the turtles jumping out of what appeared to be the World Trade Center. And uh, you don't do that. You just don't do that. That's not funny. But it started a new uh, conspiracy theory on Twitter that the turtles did 9-11, that they're responsible for it. Well, it, 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 I, I don't quite get it from the small picture. I don't quite see the see the resemblance to, uh, to a World Trade Center. But uh, if it does start a new um, uh, conspiracy theory that, that the, the Ninja Turtles did it, then that's that's if that replaces the old one, that's fine with me. Well, if you take a look at the poster on 9-11, people jumped, and they're jumping. So yeah. that's pretty distasteful. I can tell you that as a 9-11 survivor, it's very distasteful. But um, the result was pretty funny. So, And you have some pretty awful things, too. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so I've got, I've got one that a, a colleague of mine uh, wrote an article on her LinkedIn page about. And it's, it's something that applies to <coughs> the communications industries in particular, but it also applies to when you're talking to clients, because clients do this at the same time. She wrote an article about how to break up your with your industry award. It's not, it's not you, it's not me, it's you. You're too old. You've been, you know, you have that industry award from five years ago that's co been collecting dust and is no longer relevant, but you're still talking about it. You're still touting the fact that you won this award five years ago, ten years ago, whatever. So she wrote a whole article about how to break up with your uh, with your industry award. PR, advertising, especially the advertising industry, uh, is, is spends a lot of time applying for awards and, and touting their own awards. And I don't know that it brings anybody any new clients or anything. Uh, but clients too talk about about their awards, and as people who are advising our clients, we need to delicately. Maybe it's time to break up th your awards. I thought it was a really done uh, article about an, about a bad a bad practice across communications. Um, I, I do wonder if those bring business, but they cost a freaking they do. fortune. They do. They bring business. Absolutely. I actually judge about four different awards around digital marketing and public relations. And I've actually sat on committees where we've had the conversation about let's really understand, particularly for the prestigious ones, there are some people, particularly in large companies, who will say, we're now going to have an invitation to tender, let's say, for new web development or whatever. And they actually look at who are the winners. And those people who win the awards, it takes a lot of time. For some of the awards, it takes a lot of time and, in fact, in some cases, money to enter. But yes, it does bring in business. Well, one of the reasons as a small agency that I had not entered, sometimes clients entered on our behalf, but was because it's expensive. <laughs> it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and yet as and sometimes some money. Um, I've never seen it work, but I, I trust you. I trust Christian in those situations. It, it probably does. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, th th there is a problem when you're talking about your 10-year-old award still. So. <laughs> I, I agree um, with that. What is this about OkCupid? Okay, this is sort of alarming. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, was it a couple of weeks ago, Facebook got in a lot of trouble because they were experimenting on people's uh, feeds and uh, and serving up ima uh, horrible images and seeing how people react and so forth. Uh, so, okay, Cupid comes out in the wake of that and says, guess what? We experiment on human beings. I did a blog post. Guess what, everybody, if you, and I'm quoting the blog post, blog post. Guess what, everybody? If you use the internet, you're the subject of hundreds of experiments at any given time on every website. That's how websites work. So what he's referring to specifically is A-B testing or multivariate testing when you're testing the, uh, the um, efficacy of a given page or, or call to action or something on your website. Um, so on January 15, 2013, OkCupid removed all the pictures from their site. So okay, Cupid, if you don't know, is a is a match.com uh, type of site, right? And uh, they removed all the pictures from everybody's profiles. People responded to first messages after they've removed images. People responded to first messages 44% more often. The conversations uh, between people went deeper. Contact details were exchanged more quickly. Uh, but when the photos were restored at 4 p.m. that day, 2,200 people were in the middle of conversations that had started blind. Those conversations melted away. And they have a graph, and you got to see the graph, because the graph is a typical day of activity on the site. And then it shows the period of time in which they remove the images from the site. And the activity is just gone. Just nobody's using the site anymore. But this is, this is for uh, those who remain. They also took pairs of bad matches uh, where people were like 30% uh, um, compatible and told them they were exceptionally good for each other. So they took bad matches and said that you're actually a very good match and wanted to know whether that, you know, what effect that had. Uh, so does the displayed match percentage cause more than just the first messages? Uh, does the mere uh, suggestion cause people to actually li like each other? As far as we can measure, yes, it does. When we tell people they're a good match, they act as if they, w they are, even when they should be wrong for each other. Uh, <laughs> so it's a fascinating blog post to read just as far as human psychology is concerned, and, uh, and I encourage everybody to read it. Um, I don't think... I think the Facebook thing was the fact that they were the the manner in which they're doing experiments, and um, that's caused the big controversy. I think they're, the OK Cupid is right that people are experimenting all the time on their websites through A/B testing and everything, and and uh, so there you go. But you find it a little a little disturbing, BL. I do find it a little disturbing, but um, I I I have to say that not surprising, and you know. You're right about A-B testing. Everybody's doing it, but I think that when you're paying for a service, you ought, like a dating service, I assume that they pay for that, that you know, it would be good to know what the policies are. You got kind of screwing around with people's lives, you know? I had a conversation with somebody who just returned from a trip to Europe and was talking about how um, they invade your pri privacy all the time. Everything you do, they invade your privacy because they're always dropping cookies on everything that you do. And the issue is not that they're invading your privacy any more than we are. We're probably invading your privacy more than European countries. The issue is that the EU, you have to tell people that whenever you drop a cookie on their computer. So it's a, it's a usability experience for a lot of people. It's just like it's, it's freaking people out more <laughs> because they see the cookies more often. So. Yeah, it's the EU directive. It came in over a year and a half ago now. And so you'll see that on many websites that will actually say at either the top or there'll be a pop-up or something that actually um, things are being tracked. So, yeah, we see it all the time. I've been seeing that a lot. And, you know, I mean, I just tell people all the time, like, there is no privacy. Get over yourself. You know, the first time you got a credit card, you gave up your privacy. You, you, there isn't any. And, and we, our privacy wasn't taken. We gave it away. We gave out the true information on the web. We didn't have to do that. You know, I, I, it's, it's sort of a funny issue. Yes, they've taken advantage of us in in certain degree, but in a large degree, people tell information that they really don't have to tell. And, you know, you have to think about that when you're online. So we kind of need to move along. Tell us, tell us another one, Dave, and then we're, let's get to some good stuff. There's not a lot of bad news. 
Yeah, let me see what I've got in the good stuff here. Okay, so this I think is big, and it's not doesn't have anything to do with online communications or anything, but it does have to do with communications. I think of pop culture, how how this will affect communications. The New York Times came out and advocated for the legalization of pot. <laughs> this <laughs> this is a trend that is going, and pot's going to be legalized. I mean, you can just see it across the states they're they're legalizing it and Minnesota just came and de and, and legalized it for a very small percentage of uh, of medical uses um, but it seems to me that when this becomes legal the 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 culture the pot culture is going to invade it's becoming mainstream right it's becoming normalized and so along with that is a culture a certain way of uh, communicating a uh, graphic design thing that we're going to have to be paying attention to because it's going to affect everything else. Uh, so that's that was uh, fascinating mean? to me. Go ahead. What What do you mean by that? I just the, there's a there's a certain uh, there's a certain culture that goes along with marijuana that is not yet mainstream, and with the legalization of pot, it will become mainstream. Oh, I so, see. There are certain references that people who smoke pot <laughs> have that nobody else gets. Uh, we're going to have to understand what those are because it's going to be legal, and 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 uh, and there's certain just whole culture that goes along with it. So this is a long way from when I was in college, and guys from the FBI would come and talk to our freshman class about the dangers of marijuana. And there was that movie that they showed you where, like, you got high and then you went out and knocked out, knocked off a gas station. You know, when in fact people who got high does the last thing they want to do. But <laughs> yeah, we've we've definitely come. And yes, I did inhale. We've definitely come a long way since then. And um, you know, it is inevitable. And 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 I'm fascinated by this progression. And you know the little Girl Scout that I talked about one week on the show, who went in front of the marijuana clinic in Colorado and sold Girl Scout cookies, and you know sold out in like 20 minutes because everybody's hungry after they smoke. I mean, yeah, a lot of changes are going to happen. <laughs> but, Another um, one, BL, that I know that you uh, you will be interested in. Uh, we talk a lot about robots on this show, and um, there's a new experiment from Canada called Hitchbot. And Hitchbot is an experiment to see basically how people interact with uh, with robots. And Hitchbot is a robot that um, is being left on the side of the road and waiting for people to pick it up. Uh, and uh, it's just, so it's entirely dependent on, on human beings for its survival. Uh, part of a Canadian research project that that's looking at the evolution of uh, between people and technology. And what it does is it takes selfies of people who pick it pick him up. And so he's put. He's uh, got like pool noodle thingies for arms and legs, and he's got a cute little smiley face, and uh, he's got a computer in there and tweets, and uh, so he's got twittercom slash hitchbot, H-I-T-C-H-B-O-T, and Instagram with the same same username, and so you can see pictures of whoever picked it up, and um, it's just sort of a fascinating experiment that also looks at the. Uh, Interactions between uh, people and how they in this increasingly ubiquitous uh, technology. So it's sort of fun, fun to uh, to watch, and uh, and I do think that sort of robot companions are are in our future. So he's adorable. He really is. You know, also in Canada, my bank TD Bank turned um, ATMs into what they called automated thank you machines, and um, they had. It was a little clunky. They had a guy inside the machine, and so a woman came up to the machine and it said, you know, hello, Doris. Uh, we noticed that, you know, you've been helping your daughter who lives in Trinidad, and, you know, we want to thank you for being a longtime customer. And a door opens, and out comes a bouquet of flowers for her, and she's like, oh, thank you. And they said, but we noticed that you send money to her, and she said, yes, my daughter has cancer. And they said, well, you're going to see her. And the window opens up, and out comes two tickets to Trinidad, and everybody's crying. Then this guy comes in, he's wearing a baseball jersey, and the machine says, we know you're a fan of whatever, and uh, so here's two tickets to tonight's game, And but that's not all that's going to happen, and out comes someone from the team, and he says, and you're going to throw out the first ball, and it goes on like that, and you know, it, it was just lovely. So I went into my TD branch, and I said, so when are you going to do that here? And they went, do what? And I said, you know, have the ATM give out gifts. And they said, 
did that happen? I, yeah, um, it's on you know YouTube and everything. And and so the assistant branch manager said to the branch manager who I was asking, yeah, it was in your email. It came from our boss. And I said, uh huh. Well, um, thanks for giving me your email address. I know. I know if I email you, you'll never look at it. But they said they want the machine there, and they hope it will come to New York, and so do I. And I think it's just lovely when brands do things like that. Marketing should be fun, and the interaction should be real, and you know, it's just sweet. I love stuff like that. That's great. You do know, you do know that that's a ripoff of Coca-Cola's happiness. Yeah, Coca-Cola and a lot of other people too. You know, Pepsi's done things like that, and uh, but you know, is it a ripoff or is it just something wonderful? Imitation is the best form, sincerest form of flattery, right? And lots of that goes on. Uh, it gets back to the plagiarism thing, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> good point. Um, I've got a, a very fascinating, another sort of experiment, uh, and wouldn't have happened were it not for the internet and, uh, and social communication and everything. There's a woman in Minneapolis who has taken it upon herself to educate cat collars about the effect it has on the women that they're, that they're uh, harassing. And so what she has done is she's taking a video and uh, recording the, the, con the conversation so if somebody will cat call her, she'll walk up to them and say, hey, what are you doing? You know how that makes me feel, da, 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 and have a conversation with that person, record the videos of it. She hands out a card that, uh, that uh, has her website address on it, cardsagainstharassment.com. And that is intended to educate that particular person about what it's like to feel, you know, to be harassed when you're walking down the street and all you want to do is get to where you're going. Uh, so she, all the videos are up on her site, and, and you can visit that at the at, at her website. But it's a, it's a fascinating and and uh, needed um, um, public service she's offering. I was a little shocked at how frequently uh, she was harassed. So. Oh, it happens all the time, Dave. But what I was surprised about was the number of guys who said, well, I thought you liked it. You know, I thought it was okay. I mean, you know, look how you, you know, you're dressed like, you know, you look pretty, and I thought you wanted to be noticed. And noticed and, and catcalled are so different. Yes, it's a public service. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank her. <laughs> yeah. so I got one more that I just think is adorable. At, at um, IKEA in the UK, they had a sleepover for a hundred people in the store, and they got a night in the warehouse, and they got manicures, and they got massages, and they had a bedtime story read to them by a reality TV star, and then they had a sleep expert who was there to give them advice on how to get to sleep and also how to buy mattresses. And um, you know, I, I, a hundred thousand people joined the group that um, was talking about this and applying and, and asking you to apply to be there. And it was kind of like uh, an incredibly upscale um, shelter. <laughs> Which, but it reminded me of the night when I, I was uh, in the Museum of Natural History with my nephew and we got to spend a night in the museum and to go around and look at the exhibits at night and play games at night and have snacks. and. We got to sleep in the big hall where the whale is, and um, it was just the most fun. So things like that are, again, brands having fun. I think it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. So I seem to think that we're having a little bandwidth issue, and I'm wondering whether it is from the Showcase app. I wonder about that. Um, you know, I think our images are coming and going. We're going to have to see in the replay how that is. But um, Dave, I, I think that uh, we got to stop. Krishna, have we got comments? Um, all quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> I wonder if that's because the screen popped up. Because people usually talk to us during the show. I wonder if it's because the video player popped out, and yeah, they're, they're not seeing the comment page. So. <laughs> That's a major, major um, usability issue if it's popping up and, and taking you away from the show. So, it is a usability issue, but you know, um, feedback will change that as it has with uh, Hangouts over the past couple of years. It, you know, this thing keeps getting better. I, I really believe strongly that it will only improve, and that if you don't take the time to learn it now, you're really missing something wonderful. So, so this, hangout, this Hangout app is one shiny new object. Let me throw in another very quick shiny new object. Then we'll okay. wrap up the show. Uh, 
m-i-a-m-i.responsivedesign.is. It's a website. You put in your website, and it shows you how your website looks on a desktop screen, on a laptop screen, on a tablet screen, and a, and a smartphone screen. So it's a quick way of sort of getting a gauge on how your site looks like on, on a variety of different screens. It's a so. great app. I love that app. And we look pretty good. I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one that I just, I have a whole bunch, but let's just do this one. It's called Fixed. And it's a new app. It fixes parking tickets in San Francisco by noticing the errors that, that were made when they were writing the tickets. And it uses Google Street View to look at the signage, you know, because usually that's part of the issue. So if the sign, the parking sign can't be seen by a reasonably observant person, the ticket will usually get thrown out of court. And uh, for every ticket that it waves, uh, fixed charges 25% of the fee you would have had to pay. And they recently got. Uh, 1.2 million in seed money from Y Combinator and Menus, the Meru's Capital, and some angel investors, and they're going to expand to a um, hundred cities within two years. I think a lot of drivers will be happy. I live in New York. I don't drive, but I think a lot of people who do will be very happy about that. That's absolutely brilliant. I will absolutely. There are a handful of, uh, of speed traps here in the Twin Cities that uh, that I always have to watch out for. So I'll definitely. Uh, <laughs> Be on the lookout for that if I get caught for speeding next time. I don't speed. I don't speed. <laughs> so anyway, numbers, let's wrap it up. Uh, trust in sponsored content. Uh, so this is exactly what it is. It's a, a percentage of adults aged 18 to 65 asked if they uh, trust sponsored content by Content Lee did the survey. They're a content marketing outfit. 4.8% uh, I generally trust sponsored content. 18.8% um, yeah that's all. 18.8% only if I trust the publication it runs on. 22.5% only if I trust the brand already. And 53.9% no, I generally don't trust it. So more than 50% generally don't trust sponsored con content. I just wondered, you know, did they ask them how many even read it? Um, good question. No, I don't know. I didn't see that. Yeah, that would have been a good question. I think it is. I think it, it totally depends on the type of content. So, I mean, what... The problem we have is a lot of the advertising agent, advertising industry is using their methodology that they've been using forever and shoving stuff down people's throats and doing interruptive, interruptive experiences, right? As opposed to what some of the stuff that we've covered in the show before, um, what uh, like Netflix has done with uh, Orange is the New Black and doing actual content on the subject of the show which is engaging and interesting and in, 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 in uh, keeping with the type of stuff the New York Times typically runs, right? So uh, I think it really depends upon the type of content. But it also, trust in the publication itself goes back to the BuzzFeed thing. They had to fire that guy to keep, keep the, the trust of their uh, audience. And I suppose, you know. So um, I wanted to say thank you so much, Krishna, for uh, comment wrangling for us. I, I, I don't know what happened, why nobody's talking to us, but um, the experiment, it's a noble experiment to try this app out, and I think that as days go by and we have opportunity to try it in different ways, we'll learn uh, even more ways that, that, that it can be helpful. So thank you. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you so much. And um, so I think that what we will do now is we'll tell you that later on uh, we will have timestamped this video so that you will be able to jump to any segment of it by clicking on the time that um, we will post the video and the playlist with the links that we spoke about to the Beyond Social Media Show blog. And you will find us online at Beyond Social Media Show blog, at Beyond Social Media Show on Google+. You'll find David at D. Erickson on Twitter, at eStrategyBlog.com, at eStrategyTV, of course, on Google+. You'll find me at What's Next Blog, at um, Maximum Hyphen Plus for all things Google+, at um, Google+, of course, on YouTube. We're all on YouTube. You'll find Krishna at KrishnaD.com, D-E.com, on Twitter where she has a very significant following and an awful lot to say that you'll find of interest. 
and you will find us back here next Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern with episode 59 of the Beyond Social Media Show. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks.